beginning. Um, I don't actually have a security background. I have a mathematical physics and computer science background. But I currently work here uh, in Montreal for a startup called Dove Labs, um, helping them uh, implement an automated cybersecurity solution. And I'm using my machine learning, basically, experience, what I've learned from school, to um, uh, bring it to an applied problem like that. And I think that's a very um, promising and interesting field. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about, some of the basics of machine learning and hopefully to dispel some of the buzzwords and some of the um, hype that's been going around to give you a very simple intuition about what applied machine learning actually looks like in the context of network security. Now, the background motivation for my problem is um, also the growth of IoT. Right now, um, as Ms. Hara mentioned, IoT devices uh, are growing in number and they're projected to grow much more. And this growth outpaces the ability um, of security experts to really monitor um, all these networks and secure all these networks. So there's a growing demand for autonomous vulnerability monitoring and scanning solutions, autonomous vulnerability assessment solutions. But even um, when these solutions are in place, when your network goes very large, they can generate an enormous amount of data. So even if the security expert just has to go through the reports, um, as the network grows too large, you have to take steps to reduce the amount of data. Because as we all know, if you have data you don't know what to do with, that's no good. And one way to reduce the amount of data from these um, autonomous network monitoring solutions is to come up with intelligent ways of filtering out false positives. Every network is different. Um, every asset is different. So it's very difficult to just sit down and hard code a set of rules um, dictating which uh, vulnerabilities or false positives and which ones the security expert should look at. Um, it will be a futile task to maintain a hard-coded list like that by hand. So we want to learn the sort of false positive detection rule from data. And this is where machine learning comes in. Uh, the essence of learning rules and decisions driven by data rather than coded in advance. As we all know, machine learning has something to do with glowing blue cybernetic brains. As a matter of fact, it doesn't. You see a lot of these things in the media, but as I hope to explain to you, machine learning is actually based on very simple uh, principles. And one other thing I will mention is that I do not like the term AI. I know some people, some very smart people who are working in general, uh, genuine artificial intelligence, and most of the things you read about are not really AI. I would call it automated pattern recognition. And they have much simpler, much more intuitive explanations than something so buzzwordy. So, the problem we're faced with here is learning to detect false positives um, when faced with a report of vulnerabilities from our IoT network. So this is a classic example of what is called a supervised learning problem, where we have a bunch of inputs, call them X, and we wish to associate with them a bunch of outputs, call them Y. Uh, here the input is whatever report we have of the vulnerability, and the output Y is simply the label. Is this a false positive or not? Should the expert look at this, or can we discard this safely? And the goal of supervised learning is just given a bunch of examples of data, uh, pairs that have been labeled by a human, the vulnerability report X and um, the label, false positive or not Y, we just want to learn uh, an automated rule, generate an automated rule that will predict Y for new X. So yes, in this case, we just want to learn whether vulnerability is false positive or not. And this is not a very complicated paradigm. Um, Many of you might be familiar with something as basic as linear regression from high school. This is also an example of supervised learning and can be rightfully called machine learning. There's nothing mystical or glowing blue about this sort of concept. Um, and here you can see a bunch of different machine learning models. I don't expect you to understand the math, uh, but they range from very basic to very advanced, and these are all supervised learning models. And uh, the principle of all these models is really the same. What you see, you see various uh, symbols in red there. Those are called your parameters of the model. And the goal of supervised learning is to specify a model in advance and to just tweak these parameters, tweak these numbers based on data, based on some update rule, and um, to learn a good predictor. Uh, so in the linear case, the update rule can be easy for something like a neural network. Down there, it can be a bit more complicated. But even neural networks, I'm sure you've heard about deep learning, stuff like that in the news, it's not very complicated. The expression for a basic neural network can be understood with just high school mathematics. It's just matrix multiplication, addition, and function application. And the algorithm to learn this 
uh, parameters in generality is you just take an input, example x, um, you, the model makes some prediction on it, and if the prediction is wrong, you just nudge all these parameters a little bit and to make the prediction closer to what the true label is. The algorithm for nudging the parameters is different for all these models, but the principle is the same and it's very basic. And I hope to leave you with this intuition that it's not complicated. Um, right, but how do you choose which model to use here? We have uh, these you know, four options and there's numerous other examples. And in order to choose a model to use, you have to make assumptions about your data. So in machine learning, where your expertise really shines, is not in you know, how much math you know or how com complicated of a model you can set up, but it's in how well you understand uh, the assumptions, um, how well you understand the distribution of your data and how strong the assumptions you can make in your data. What invariants can you specify? And making assumptions in machine learning is actually critical. There are, it's mathematically provable that there is no general magic machine learning algorithm that will work in any given problem. The reason for this is very basic. Uh, if you consider, say, a set of measurements, call them features, say in this room you could say the temperature, the pressure, number of people, and you have examples composed of these measurements, the number of possible objects uh, with the set of measurement grows exponentially, and the number of possible models you could learn theoretically grows doubly exponentially. So you can see in the right-hand column, if you make no, assumption, no assumptions about your data, you will never be able to learn anything. Um, just an example, if you take a small image with just black and white pixels, the number of features is 500. So the number of possible images and the number of possible objects is astronomical. So you have to make assumptions about your data. And this is the real magic of machine learning. It's not fancy math, but it's knowing and understanding your data. And the stronger the assumption you make about your data, as long as it's correct, you, the less data you need to train it. So and that's where your expertise will shine in applying any machine learning model. Now, and aside about neural networks, again, no glowing blue brains. The connection to the human brain is only minimal, and it should not be hyped up at all. The reason they work so well is because the assumption they make about the data is quite general. Uh, they assume that the data has something called the compositionality property, that when, you say, you see the image of a person wearing a hat, having a beard, wearing glasses, that what looks like glasses isn't just a random collection of pixels, but it represents some concrete, semantically meaningful object <coughs> that means the same thing in different images. And it just so happens that this compositionality assumption that neural networks make corresponds very closely to what the world is actually like. The world isn't just random noise that we see. It's persistent objects and larger objects made of smaller objects. And because neural networks reflect that assumption in their mathematical structure, that's why they're so successful. There is no magic involved. It's all about knowing and understanding the data you're looking at. Uh, but this, because this is a very general assumption, it can model many, many things in the world. That's another reason that neural networks are quite data hungry sometimes. That's why they're associated with big data. Um, and if you know that a simpler model will work, if you have some domain expertise, that means you can make a stronger assumption about what you expect to see, you can train with less data. So that's very important to keep in mind. Neural networks are not you know, the end all be all. But back to our vulnerability example. This is what real vulnerability data looks like. It's you know, just a JSON format of some text, you know, timestamps, dates, strings. Um, but if you noticed all the uh, equations, all the models that I showed you, they work in numbers. So there's an important, another important aspect of machine learning uh, where expertise can shine, and that is feature extraction. As in, you have to take whatever your representation of data might be, and you have to extract some numerical features on which you can run your algorithm. And there's two ways about this. You can extract these features either manually or automatically. Manual feature extraction, you simply define, well, whether the string is present or not, that's going to be one, not present zero, and other various attributes that you code in advance by hand. This is very simple to implement, but in some sense you can say it, it defeats the purpose of machine learning because you have to specify what's going to be relevant and what is going to be not relevant in advance, where when you're dealing with a very sort of dynamic um, and large amount of data, you want that to uh, arise from the data naturally following some algorithm. But automatic extraction is also quite difficult, though not impossible. Perhaps the most prominent example of automated feature extraction, which is also known as unsupervised learning, as in learning without an explicit label Y, where you take um, your input data, say your set of all vulnerabilities as JSON files, and you have some clever algorithm that extracts their most fundamental essence and reduces them to a small collection of numbers. 
Uh, this has been done with the English language in a very famous machine learning model. I think everyone should be familiar with it. It's called work to vec. And what it does, basically words to vectors, that's what it means. And what it did was, it, it's a very simple algorithm. It took a very large body of English text, uh, millions of words, I think even up to billions of words now. And it took words that appear in similar context next to each other. And it took their vector representation and just nudged them a little bit closer together. And then it took words that don't appear close and it nudged their vector representations a bit farther apart. And it's a very simple algorithm that was iterated over and over on a large number um, of words. And the results of it were remarkable. You can see that this is a representation of um, a two-dimensional slice, you can think of it, of the vectors that it learned. And you can see that, for instance, the countries and their capitals have the same relationship, even though this was never programmed by hand. And uh, there are many other similar relationships, say, between man and woman and king and queen has the same vector offset. And these are very important semantic um, relations that we learn from language that was extracted from the data automatically. So unsupervised learning is something that can show a lot of promise. But it's not trivial to implement. Um, and again, you have to understand your assumptions. For instance, could we just take our vulnerabilities and run this very same algorithm on them and get something meaningful? No, not really, because um, the vulnerabilities uh, we look at, uh, they have, the, their structure is quite a bit different. For instance, the notion of nearness and similarity is different. It's not just, you know, proximity. Um, uh, they might, there might be clusters of different types of vulnerabilities that only appear in specific assets and that don't really um, interact with one another and so they never appear in each other's neighborhood, so to speak. Um, and so there's, that's to say there's just various pitfalls in applying the sort of general strategy and again, the takeaway message is check your assumptions about your data, really apply your expertise to understand what the critical structure of the data you're looking at is. Um, and then uh, even basic machine learning algorithms can work well. Um, another example of unsupervised learning, for instance, is you can um, use it for data visualization. This is just a, a basic example where you can take something from 30 dimensions and reduce it to two dimensions so you can uh, see it and visualize it. But this is you know, just a tangential use of this technique. Um, finally, I'd like to talk about Bayesian methods, what was on the uh, talk title. Uh, you'll notice that the techniques I mentioned previously, they're all deterministic. When you train your model and you fix some set of parameters based on your training data, uh, you get basically a function that takes one input x and gives you a determined output y. Um, this function has no notion of uncertainty, like how confident is it in its output? Or even if you constrain the output to be between zero and one, it's not really gonna be a mathematically valid probability. Uh, you want another technique that actually captures this uncertainty, which is very important um, uh, when dealing in the sort of uh, domain where understanding how certain you are uh, of your conclusions is um, important. And for this, uh, we can introduce Bayesian methods. Uh, the Bayesian technique basically uh, means that you don't learn one single set of parameters from your model, you don't learn just one function from input to output, but you learn, you learn a distribution, you learn a certain degree of uncertainty about which parameters are correct. And then looking at your data, you refine your uncertainty a little bit, you can be more confident that the parameters are within, the, within one particular range versus some other range. Um, but then this translation, this uncertainty in your parameters naturally translates to uncertainty in your output, which you can use to gain um, a truly probabilistic measure of how certain you are in the output of your machine learning model. Uh, so in some sense, you can get probability estimates uh, for free if you use a Bayesian model in your output. And uh, another advantage of the Bayesian technique is that um, the formula I'm gonna show you next has an explicit term for incorporating things you know about your domain, things you know about your data, before you've even seen any example. So for instance, if you have a lot of expertise in say classifying uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, and you know just the things to look at, you don't want your machine uh, learning model to have to relearn all of that from scratch. You can encode that in your Bayesian prior, it's called, and um, get a more sort of principled estimate. Uh, the downside of these methods is that um, modern implementations are quite computationally intensive, and there's a lot of work going on to uh, reduce that burden. All of Bayesian methods, what I mentioned, is just predicated on one simple formula. Uh, this is Bayes' rule, it's a theorem of probability, and it's quite basic, really, once you break it down. On the left-hand side is what is called your posterior. Uh, that is, given the data you've seen, 
given what you've observed and the labels you've seen, what do you expect your parameters to be? That is what you want to learn. On the right-hand side, you have your likelihood. That is the probability of your data given your parameters. That is where you encode your model. If you have a linear model, then the likelihood of seeing a point very high up, if your slope is low, is going to be small, just by the definition of the model. That's where you encode your model structure. And then on the right-hand side, the prior term, which is the probability of your parameters, that is your prior knowledge, as I mentioned. Even if you don't see any data, you'll notice that um, the, uh, the posterior will just correspond to your prior, uh, will be proportional to your prior. Um, that just means that that is the information you as an expert bring to the table in the absence of any um, examples or data. And the evidence, it's sort of, it's rarely talked about, it's just a, uh, it's not really mathematically useful from a conceptual standpoint, you just need it to get the um, probabilities to be valid and to stay in the right range. And you can apply these Bayesian methods to any other machine learning technique, basically, even something as basic as linear regression. You can get Bayesian linear regression. Where instead of learning a single slope and intercept, you learn a distribution over slopes and intercepts. And from that, you can get a very principled estimation of your predictions for unseen values of x. So if those gray lines were more spread out, if you had less data, that gives you a very intuitive feeling for um, how certain you are in your prediction. And you can use that to inform your decisions. Um, finally, I just want to mention that there is another sort of um, machine learning paradigm that's very powerful that's inherently probabilistic and uses Bayes' theorem from the start. Um, and that is basically graphical models. I won't belabor the math too much, but it's basically, um, it's a powerful way of breaking down a complicated set of uncertainties, uh, probability over various states of the world, and using your prior knowledge to um, uh, make them more tractable and make them more understandable. In this case, for instance, we have, say, three random variables, um, how hard it snows, how much, uh, whether the flight was delayed or not by the blizzard, or whether your car got stuck in the snow. I couldn't think of a cheerier example yesterday. Don't ask me why. Um, uh, we know that uh, we use our intuition about the world to know that the snow co causes both of these things. And once we know how much it's snowing, then the, whether the flight is delayed has no bearing on whether the car is stuck or not. Both of them depend only on how much it snows. So that way, we can use our understanding of the world to break down a complicated set of random variables and uncertainties about the world into a more principled and easier to manage set of causes and effects. And the way you reason about these variables and infer them is at the heart of it, just basically Bayes' theorem again. Um, so that's basically my conclusion. I just wanted to present to you a brief overview of what machine learning actually looks like, that it's not mystical glowing brains, and that a lot of it is based on very simple math, and that the main lesson of machine learning isn't how clever you can be with your model, but how well you understand your problem domain, and that it would be a mistake to use something as fancy as a neural network when you can use something as simple as linear regression if you understand your data. And finally, um, for any machine learning method, if you have to deal with uncertainty, or if you have to deal with any sort of um, understanding of the world on a probabilistic level, you want to use Bayes' theorem and Bayesian methods, of which, you know, there, there's courses written in this stuff. I can't go into that into, in this meeting, but I just want to give you a glimpse of what's out there. Thank you very much.